Recently, we looked at the first ever commercial continuous track engine, and it got me thinking, what was the first ever commercial steam engine? It wasn't rocket, or even locomotion number one. In fact, it predates rocket by 17 years. The name of this engine was Salamanca. No one could forget the success of Richard Trevivic and his amazing steam engine in 1804. It proved that railed and track engines were possible. However, while the engine proved it could work, after its demonstration, it went right back to work as a stationary steam hammer. There were no plans to reproduce an engine on a wider scale. In fact, there was little need as the Industrial Revolution at the time was being well fed by the various canal networks. At the time Trevivic was showing off his steam engine, war was being fought on the high seas. Lord Horatio Nelson triumphed over the French in the Battle of Trafalgar, and while the battle mortally wounded him, the battle was heralded a great victory and was accumulation and a finale of many sea battles. Napoleon, however, wasn't done yet. Rather than settle the dispute on the sea, Napoleon annexed Hanover and, under several treaties, closed both Prussian and Hanoverian ports. This forced Great Britain's hand and, consequently, they declared war on Prussia. Now thrust headlong into a Napoleonic war, demand was at a premium for many products, including coal. The current methods of collecting and moving coal was now inadequate for the country's needs. In addition, the feeds that were feeding the horses on the railways were now feeding the horses on the front, meaning a massive shortage of food and with it, horsepower. The Middleton Railway was one of the hardest hit. Its primary propulsion was horsepower. Mine owner Charles John Brandling turned to manager John Blenkinsop to bring new ideas to the table to solve the problem. John had heard of experiments with Trivivik's designs and knew there was some promise in how they worked. However, the engines were not adequate for their trains as they lacked the adhesion to pull them. He also knew that the current wooden rails that the horses used would not support a large steam engine. From his research, Blenkinsop developed the rack and pinion. Now I've covered the rack and pinion before in a previous video, but I'll give a brief overview. As well as the standard twin iron rails, a toothed rail was also placed alongside them. The proposed engine would have a cogged wheel, which would run on this tooth rail, giving the engine extra adhesion. With the problem of adhesion out of the way, now Blenkinsop only needed the engine. He turned to engineer Matthew Murray. He was a designer of many different fields, but predominantly worked in textiles. Not much is known about Matthew Murray's early life, only that he was born in Newcastle-upon-Tyne and that he left school at 14 for an apprenticeship as a blacksmith. He moved to Leeds in 1789 after working the flax mills in Darlington. He set up his own trade after meeting and partnering with David Wood and James Fenton. Murray was in charge of the technical innovations and he wanted to improve output on the steam engines that powered the looms as well as make them lighter and simpler. Many steam engines suffered greatly from assembly issues which took time and more importantly money to correct. Murray improved mostly on the transfer of linear motion to circular motion. While he couldn't use the standard method of the crank and flywheel, which had already been patented, he worked on other methods and made the Murray Hypsoclonical engine, which still works today. He also invented a fully alternated dampener and mechanical hopper. According to historical records, Murray was a man of precision. He had exceptionally high standards of workmanship and he expected the same from his engines and his employees. As a result, Murray had an engine shop called the Round Foundry. All the machines were powered by a singular steam engine in the centre, and it even supplied Murray's own house with steam heating when he built his home next door. It was no surprise that given his high standards that Blenkinsop would approach Murray for his engine. Murray had a plan, but he needed Trevithick's help. Trevithick still had the patent for the high-pressure steam boiler, so a quick payment to him meant that Murray could use the design as well. Instead of copying the patent, Murray improved on it. Rather than one cylinder, 
Murray gave the engine two 8-inch by 20-inch cylinders. The twin cylinders gave the engine a smoother drive. Its centre wheel would be cogged for the rack and pinion, and the wheels were driven through cranks. The engine was delivered to the mine in 1812 and was christened Salamanca in honour of the Duke of Wellington's victory of the Battle of Salamanca for earlier in the year. Blenkinsop and Murray were pleased with this engine. It did everything as promised, and Murray would produce three other brother engines to the Salamanca, each costing £350, which would serve other collieries in the north. They were very successful, with some racking up up to 20 years of service. Sadly though, Salamanca would have a very short life compared to its brothers. In 1817, the colliery was rocked when Salamanca's boiler suddenly exploded, killing its driver. At the inquest, it was discovered that the likely cause was the driver tampering with the safety valve. Early safety valves were sometimes oversensitive and were not really made for moving engines. In fact, it was common that a single bump or dip in the track was enough to open the valve and waste pressurised steam into the atmosphere, much to the driver's frustration. Some drivers, in an attempt to improve performance, would screw down the valve, but the increase in steam pressure would push the engine beyond its design limits and with nowhere to go, the steam would explode out of the boiler with terrible consequences. It wouldn't be until 1856 when John Ramsbottom's new tamper-proof design came into force and all engines were fitted with it universally. While Salamanca's life ended rather abruptly, its memory didn't. In 1811, to commemorate his achievement and to show prospective investors on how the engine would work, Murray built a model replica of the engine. For over a hundred years after Salamanca was built, the model's whereabouts was unknown and was likely in the hands of a family or private collector, but it was given to the Leeds Museum collection for display in 1943, still in amazing condition. The model was loaned to the Science Museum Group in 2019 for a special exhibition and has since been returned to the Leeds Industrial Museum, where the engine calls home. It is, to date, the oldest model engine anywhere in the world. Murray's design and innovation would shake up the railway world and would go on to inspire a new generation of steam engines. And while we don't have the actual engine anymore, it's great that we have the model. The Leeds Industrial Museum is open daily and it's worth a visit. It has stories from great inventors that help shape the city and Salamanca's model fits in with these greats beautifully. <laughs>